We are honored tonight to have Brother Daniel McCullum with us. Uh, I found out Brother Greg just got him in the nick of time. He told me just a minute ago that he retired about two weeks ago. So we got him right after retirement. We are so glad that he and his wife Mary are with us here tonight. They've been married for 48 years. They've got four children, two boys and two girls, and nine grandchildren. He's been preaching for the North Green Street Congregation for about 15 years. I, told, I asked him, I, I said, Brother McCollum, what does this congregation need to know about you? He said, just tell them I'm just an old country preacher. Well, Brother McCollum, come preach the word. Good evening. Hope everyone is doing extremely well tonight. We have a reason to rejoice. Am I not right? We're the only people who have a, a real leader in our lives. We're the only people who have a king that will never die. He's ro uh, ruling and he shall rule until this world shall come to an end. And so we have a reason to rejoice. Many people serve Dictators, they serve leaders in other places, but we serve the God of heaven, and that's a good thing. I want to thank the elders and the ministers for inviting me to be a part of this summer series that you're having. And uh, I believe it's all about our hearts, did our hearts burn? Jesus, that, that uh, is taken from one of the incidents after the resurrection of Jesus our Lord. And I hope tonight that I'll be able to say some things that will motivate you and will encourage you and uplift you and cause you to want to be a greater servant for the Lord. Tonight I shall be dealing with Acts chapter 8, dealing with the, with the Philip and the church at Samaria. The, it's, it's a good lesson and it's really evangelistic lesson. And this lesson is rooted... Uh, Back in the book of John, many times people think that Philip did a great job, and he did do a great job in the city of Samaria. But the reason people responded so well, it is because of the groundwork that had been done years before. Many of us fail to remember that or to understand that when we study the book of Acts, especially Acts chapter 8. Now, Jesus had told them uh, about the kingdom in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we find where Jesus met the woman at the, at the well. Jesus talked with her about everything in her life. And she, uh, he asked water of her. And of course, she says the well is deep and we have nothing to draw with. But Jesus talking about a different kind of water. He said, if you drink of the water that I give, you shall never thirst again. She did not understand that he was sowing seeds of the kingdom at that particular time. Tonight, I want to sow some seeds tonight. And everyone who is a member of the body of Christ ought to be motivated and inspired to be seed sowers. Many people feel guilty because they do not, uh, have not been able to convert people or baptize someone. But always remember, God did not tell us to baptize folks. But he did say, go teach everybody. Am I not right about it? Did he not say that in Mark chapter 16 and verses 15 when he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And when he said it again in Matthew chapter 28 and verses 19 when he said, Go teach all nations. So our responsibility is to teach. And tonight there are going to be three points that we want to make. Number one, the seeds of the gospel were sown in Samaria in advance. It was sown by Jesus Christ prior to Philip going down to the city of Samaria. Point two we want to make tonight is we must leave our comfort zone in order to capitalize upon the seed that have been sown. And the third point we want to make, God will give the increase. God will give the increase. As we look at the seed that was sown, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 8, and about verse 11, that the seed is the word of God. So Jesus sowed the word of God 
uh, to the woman at the well. And as a result of that, she went and told all the people in the city about what Jesus had done for her. Told her all about her previous life, all about her marriages. And she said that she'd been married five times, uh, Jesus said. And the one that she had then was not a husband. That was not Jesus' purpose to deal with marriage. He was just simply helping her to understand who he was. And of course, she went and told all the men. And they came and they talked with Jesus. They encouraged him to stay in the city of Samaria two days. Now, what's so significant about this? Sumerian people were half Jews and half Gentile. The Jews had no dealings with the Sumerians. If they had to go to a place and the route uh, routed them through Samaria, they would go miles out of their way to avoid having any dealings with Samaria. This is why that I gave the passage tonight in John chapter 10 and verses 7, uh, 16 where Jesus said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them too must I bring in. Most of the time we refer to that being the household of Cornelius, rightfully so. But the Samaritans was also included in this. Remember, Jesus had taught his disciples, first of all, to go to the lost sheep of Israel. And they had done a good job of that. Uh, and when the church come into existence, uh, when it was about to come into existence, he told his disciples, he told the apostles, in Acts chapter 1 and verses 8, that they would be witnesses of him both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the world. The church had done a fabulous job preaching the gospel in Jerusalem and in Judea. In fact, they had done such a great job in Jerusalem that it was said of them that they had turned the whole city upside down with the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But they were reluctant to go other places. They did a good job in all Samaria, or excuse me, all Judea. But they did not go to Samaria. Now, Jesus sent his disciples out uh, uh, two, in pairs of two. And I believe it's a good way to do it today. When we go out doing mission work and teaching, it ought to be two. Someone else ought to be with you, number one, to protect your reputation. Number two, they need to be a witness to the word of the Lord. Well, they went out and did a fantastic job, but they did not go beyond the borders of Judea. Why? Were they being rebellious? No, they were comfortable in Jerusalem. They were all one in Jerusalem. The Bible says in Acts chapter uh, 4 that they all that believed were of one heart, one soul, and of one mind. 4.32. So they were together. They were comfortable. They had all things in common. So much so unto those who had house and land, sold it and bought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet so that no one in the group were neglected. Everybody's needs were being met. We see a problem arose in Acts chapter 6. The problem was that because of the church had grew so large, the Grecian widows were being neglected in the daily administration of food. The Grecian widows were those who spoke other languages that came from other places when the church come into existence. And when they come to Jerusalem, because of the gospel, because of the fellowship, because of the koinonia that they were having together, they did not return home, which created some hardship. And their needs were being met in the daily administration. But the Grecian widows, for some reason, got neglected. And they got sidetracked from their main objective. I'll get to Acts chapter 8 in just a moment. But they got sidetracked from their main objective. The main objective was to glorify God and to teach the Word. There was a decrease in the teaching of the Word because there was a problem existing in the congregation. And the apostles told the congregation, after they brought the situation to them, the apostles said there's no reason that we should leave the Word of God that we should serve table. Look ye out among yourselves, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit, whom we may appoint over this business. They appointed seven men. And Philip was one of those seven men. Philip was from the country of Caesarea. Philip was a man that had a family. He had a family, a wife, and he had four virgin daughters. Acts 21 will point that out to us. 
Not only did Philip have a good family, but he was a good, godly man, working. Just like I believe there are many great, godly men here who are working for the cause of Christ. You wouldn't be doing some of the things that you're doing if there were not some great, godly people who are here. Let us observe some other things. What was going on, though? Problem was in the church. The problem was resolved when they appointed those seven men. Some said they were deacons. The Bible does not actually say they were deacons, but those seven men were appointed. And when they were appointed, the problem was resolved. Now notice what transpired. When the problem was resolved, there was an increase in the teaching of the Word of God. And the number of the disciples multiplied. When we are at peace, when we are unified together, there will be more teaching. And when there is more teaching, there will be more people responding to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I thought we were going to be talking about Acts chapter 8, someone said. We're going to get there. But as a result of the church growing, there was also some folks in the church, uh, around the church there, who did not want the church to grow. It did not, they did not want it to spread. What did they do about it? They began to persecute the church. They began to persecute the church. Was this just the idea of men, or did God allow these things to happen because men and women were not fully carrying out his plan? Remember, those whom God loved, he rebuked and chastened. He loves all of us. And if we're not doing his will, you can rest assured there's going to be some rebuking and some chasing somewhere. Remember, the Bible teaches in Galatians 6 and verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not marked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So we're going to reap what we sow. You sow good seeds, you sow the seeds of the gospel, you're going to reap eternal life when you do the will of the Lord. Now, as a result of this, Stephen was preaching the gospel. And as a result of this, the, the, the chief priests and others rebelled against him. They wanted to hush him up because he was turning people away from Judaism. Notice what transpired. There was a young man there from the city of Atosius. And this young man was there, and he had been sitting and learning from Gamaliel, who was a doctor of the law. This young man was the name of Saul. He encouraged the men to put Stephen to death. He held their coat and consented unto his death. When Stephen was killed, Saul took an active role in persecuting the church. In other words, he was a man that had some means about, about him. He had some money. He had influence. He had enough of influence where he could get a letter from the high priest and go and persecute Christians wherever he found them. And we know that in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says, uh, at, after the death of Stephen, then Saul began to make havoc or shipwreck of the church. Now when he began to make shipwreck of the church or began to persecute members of the body of Christ, people began to do what God told them in Acts chapter 1 and verses 8. In Acts chapter 1 and verses 8, again, Jesus said, Ye shall be witness of me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The Bible says, And the disciples went everywhere preaching the word of God. Now, they did not go, they did not go to Samaria. The question is asked, why? Why did they not go? Because they allowed their old feelings to come up again. Whenever we obey the gospel, if we're not careful, whatever problem that we had prior to obeying the gospel, those problems will come back again. The devil knows how to get to you. He knows how to get to all of us. In other words, he knows your weakness. And if he knows your weakness, he's going to use it against you. What was their problem? They had problems with the with the Samaritans because they did not believe that the Samaritans deserved to be fellowship. Why? Because of something that happened hundreds of years before any of them were born. Samaritans were half Jews and half Gentile. They were put there or when Cyrus took all the people away in captivity, then we find that there were a remnant left. There was no men there 
and they begin to intermarry with the world or uh, with the heathens. And this is where we come up with the Samaritan race of people. And the Jews had nothing to do with them. And so the apostle remained in Jerusalem and the disciples went everywhere, Acts 8 and 4, preaching the word of God. But Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. Now notice, who went with Philip? No one went with him. Now the rule was, you go two by two. I want to help you to appreciate that even further. When they were converted, the apostles, they didn't send just one apostle down there. They sent two apostles down there, Peter and John. And we'll deal with that a little bit later on. But when the, Philip went down there, he preached Christ unto them. It was easy for Philip to convert them preaching Christ because the seed had already been sown by Jesus in John chapter 4 when he went down to Samaria and met with the woman at the well. Now, you're not just going to just all of a sudden teach an individual without preparing the soil. In Luke chapter 8, we can see where the soil was prepared. A soil went forth sowing. Some seed fell upon what kind of ground? Good ground. Some upon stony ground. Some among thorns and thistles. Some upon rocky ground. Which one prospered? That which fell upon the good ground, the ground that had been prepared. When we sow the seed today, somebody has to prepare the ground. Somebody has to prepare the heart of the individual so they will be receptive to the Word of God. Jesus had done that. Now, as a result of that, Philip is now in the city of Samaria. He preached Christ unto them. He healed them. He worked miracles among them. And there was a fellow down there that we call, where I grew up, I grew up in North uh, West Alabama. And in North West Alabama, we had some people, they were nine then, that we'd come around and they want to read your poem. There were some people that come around and they want to tell your fortune. They were people who dealt in curious arts or witchcraft. Some called them witch doctors. Some called them voodoo doctors in Haiti. And other places, they are called just hoodoo doctors. But these were men who had bewitched the people, used trickery in order to give out him that, to the people that he himself was some great power of God. And the people saw the signs or the miracles that were wrought by Philip. And they all obeyed the gospel, including, including uh, Simon the sorcerer. Why did Philip go down there? What enabled him to go and do all this? Number one, he had the love of the Lord. Jesus said in John 14 and 15, If you love me, you'll keep my teaching. When we love the Lord, we'll do what he asked us to do. Philip was doing what God asked him to do. In order to do the will of the Lord, you have to leave your comfort zone. Philip had to leave his family. His family was not with him on this particular missionary trip. Philip left the comfort of the church in Jerusalem. He left alone to do the will of God. Just because we are by ourselves, there is no reason why we ought not to do the will of God with the people that we come in contact with. God is still in the business of putting saints and sinners together. And God was in the business then. And so Philip left his comfort zone in order that he might do good for others. Did Philip know how many people were going to respond? No. Do you know how many people are going to respond when you teach the Word of God? No, we don't. Sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. But it's not our business to worry about how many is going to respond. Our business is to do the Lord's will. And what did he ask us to do? The same thing that he asked the apostles to do. The same thing that he asked the early church to do, the Christians to do. The same thing that he asked Philip to do. What did he ask Philip to do? He asked Philip to preach the Word to teach the gospel, to carry out the good news or the hurdle forth the good news. And so Philip left his comfort zone and he began to preach the gospel. And they all obeyed the gospel in the city of Jerusalem for two reasons. Number one, because Jesus had laid the foundation. Somebody else had sowed the seed. It was Jesus. Number two, they were able to obey or respond to the gospel because Philip left the comfort zone and he cultivated that seed that was sown. 
And when you cultivate the seed, there's going to be an increase. God always gives the increase. The Lord said his seed would not return unto him void, or his word would not return unto him void. Notice what happened. The Bible says, and after they had all obeyed, it said, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as of yet he was fallen upon none of them. All of them had been baptized. The whole city of Jerusalem had been baptized, including Simon the saucer. And when they were baptized, they were saved. The Bible teaches us in Mark 16 and 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So the city of Samaria believed the word of God. They had believed prior to Philip going there, but the church had not been established. It was not established until a few years later or after the death of Jesus Christ. And after the death of Christ, the church did not go down to Samaria. I don't know all the reasons why, but we do know they went no further than Judea until Philip took the gospel down there several years later. And when Philip took the gospel, they all obeyed. And the Bible says in verses 14 of Acts chapter 8, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent two people down there. They sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as of yet he was fallen upon none of them. In Acts 2 and verses 38, it says, Repent and be baptized every one of you and in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost here had reference to receiving something that they could, re they could identify with. Why did they need the gift? What, what was so important about having the gift of the Holy Ghost? We hear a lot about that today. And a lot of people are talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. But if the church is going to grow, if God's going to be uplifted, we must uplift Jesus. For the Bible says, Jesus himself said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Well, why did they need the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit was promised, number one. Go back to Joel chapter 2 and verses 28. It shall come to pass, saith God, in the last day, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your son and your daughter shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. They were looking for something when the church come into existence. What were they to get? The apostles received the baptism measure of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2. Everybody else did not receive that baptismal measure. Who received the baptismal measure? It was the 11 apostles plus Matthias. When you go back to Acts chapter 1 in the last verse, the Bible says, And they gave forth their lot, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, when they heard this, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. That's the apostles. What was this? Fill all the house where they were sitting. This was the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were covered with the Holy Spirit. That was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. Well, what about the other people? What did they get? Did they get the Holy Spirit? Yes, but the question is asked, how did they get it? And when we look at what Philip had done in Samaria, we can see how they received the Holy Spirit. And if we have what they had, then obviously the apostles are still alive today. And I don't think any of us believe that. They are not alive. Well, what do we have? What do we comfort one another with? First Thessalonians chapter 4 said we are to comfort one another with the Word of God. The power to save is in the Word, one with one and verses 16. Notice what transpired in Acts chapter 8. We go back to where the apostles were there. They sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as of yet he was fallen upon none of them. They were baptized. They were saved. They were fully Christian. God had gave the increase, but they did not have the Holy Spirit. How did they receive it? They received it only one way. And it was after baptism. They had been baptized for several days, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. How did they receive it? Well, the Bible said that when Simon saw that through the lying on 
of the apostles' hand, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hand, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon recognized, if anybody would recognize a true thing, it would be the imposter. Simon, remember, had used sorcery and bewitched the people, giving out that he himself was the great one of God. But now he sees the real thing, the real power. And you can, have, you can be connected with the real power. The real power today is in Jesus Christ and in his word. Notice what Simon saw. He saw that through the line on the apostles' hand the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money, saying, Give me also this power to own whomsoever I lay hand, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Notice what transpired. And Peter rebuked him right there to his face. He said, Simon, thy money perish with thee, because thy heart is not right with God. Repent of this thy weakness, and pray God, it's perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. The Samaritans all obeyed the gospel. They did not have the Holy Spirit until after Peter and John laid hands upon them. Why was it so important that they received the land on hands measure of the Holy Spirit? It was important for several reasons. Number one, they did not have what we have. What do we have that they did not have? They did not have a complete Bible. They did not have a New Testament. All they had was whatever the Spirit directed him to say or do. And the way that they proved what they were saying was correct was through the signs and wonders and miracles which were done. And Philip worked those miracles there in the city of Samaria, and they saw that, and they knew that it was the Word of God. Now, since God has given the command to go teach, and everybody have that responsibility who is a child of God, how were they going to teach if they did not have the written word? They were going to teach because the Holy Spirit would direct them in what to say. This is why the Holy Spirit was given. It was given to them so they could teach the word of God. Now, someone says, well, I don't see it that way. I just can't understand that. When you go back to John chapter 16, about verse 13, Jesus himself said, How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall take a mind and shall show it unto you. So this is why that the, all the Christians in Acts chapter 8 needed the laying on hands measure of the Holy Spirit in order that they could go teach. Now, were they effective in teaching? The question or the answer is yes. Every individual that uh, had laying on a hand measure of the Holy Spirit was actively teaching the Word of God. Everyone today who is baptized and who has been taught the Word of God then ought to be actively involved in teaching the Word of God. How is the church going to grow? The preacher cannot do it all. The elders cannot do it all. God never intended for it to happen that way. God intended for every baptized believer to get involved in preaching and teaching the Word. Remember in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, the disciples went everywhere. What were they doing when they went? They were hurling forth the good news. They were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a result of their preaching, God gave the increase. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God give the increase. God will give the increase when the heart is right. When the individual has uh, received the word of God, it had germinated in his heart. If the individual is honest, he's going to respond. God will give an increase. God gave 3,000 increase in Acts chapter 2. We can see in Acts chapter 3, the church is growing. Again in Acts chapter 4, there was a multitude. And then there was 5,000. And then in Acts chapter 6, the church is now being multiplied. Here's a whole city of Samaria obeying the gospel. And now the church is being spread throughout Europe, throughout the known world. Paul said in Colossians 1 and verse 23 that every creature under heaven had heard the word of God. How is it that everybody heard the word of God? It is because every baptized believer who was faithful to the Lord was actively sharing the good news to somebody. I don't know the people that you know. You don't know the people that I know. But God puts you in contact with people every day. He puts me in contact with people every day. And God expects us to do what Philip did in Acts chapter 8, to go and preach the word. 
There's a saying that I come up with some time ago. A plus O equals R. You didn't know we teach a little mathematics. We used to call it arithmetic. Anybody remember calling it arithmetic? We did a little bit of that in the Lord's church. You know what A stands for? Ability. O here means opportunity. You have the ability and your ability can be improved. God will give you the opportunity. Opportunity will present itself. He'll put you and the senator, center together. And that'll make it your responsibility then to share the gospel with them. Everybody here tonight ought to go home and tell somebody or call somebody and tell them about the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many of you use social media a lot? Raise your hand. I'm in the old school. I can't hardly, open, uh, can't hardly dial my phone. I have to get my grandkids to teach me how to do it. But how many use social media? Do you know that's a good way of proclaiming Christ on social media? If they'd have had social media in Acts chapter 8, I believe Philip would have used that. But he did not have social media. They did not have telephone. They did not have TV nor radio. But they used what they had. God expects you and he expects me to use what we have. You know, I'm reminded of a story. I was told someone, a part of it back here a little bit earlier before service started. That was a young man that went home with a lady. She had invited him home, an elderly lady, to eat with her. And he went over there and she fixed his plate and said, go ahead and eat, young man. He said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I, I never eat before I preach. You ever had preachers do say that? Never eat before I preach. I can't preach if I eat. And so he did not eat. She said, well, I'll have you something when the service is over. And when the service was over, uh, he met her at the door back there. And he wanted to know, you know, he felt like he had impressed her with his preaching. And so he wanted to know how was he doing. And so the young lady, the uh, older lady told him, says, uh, son, you should have just went ahead and eat. In Acts chapter 8, Philip delivered the word. People responded. God gave the increase. When you deliver the word, somebody else might have laid the foundation. Somebody else may have uh, prepared the soil. But when you teach the word, you share the good news, then God will give the increase. And this congregation here will begin to grow. It'll grow and grow and grow more. Somebody's done a fantastic job already because of the presence of the people who are here on Wednesday night. I go to a lot of places. A lot of places, there's only a very few people on Wednesday night. I don't understand why. Many churches have already cut out their Sunday evening services because people don't show up. But God expects us to worship Him all day on the Lord's Day. All the Lord's Day belong to Him. And He expects us to worship. Do you think the Samaritan church you, do you think that they just only wished him, worship him for a little while? In Acts chapter 20, we can see where that they worship him. Not only on what time they started that day, but they didn't give him just one hour. They didn't give him just two. But the Bible says Paul continued his speech until midnight. I'm going to quit before midnight. You don't have to worry about that. I'm going to be just like Elizabeth Taylor told her seventh husband. You remember what she said? She told him, I shall not keep thee very long. <laughs> I hope tonight I've said some things to help you to understand a little bit about the book of Acts, especially Acts chapter 8. It's a great book. It helps us to leave our comfort zone. Those individuals were of a different race that Philip taught, but it didn't make any difference. God's word is for all. And all of us need to be busy about teaching the people that God put us in contact with every day. At this time, uh, we want to go ahead and extend the invitation. For those of you who are not members of the body of Christ, there's only one way that you can go to heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and about verses 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. If you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to come by Jesus. What does it mean to come by Him? It means that He must become your Lord. It means that you must become His servant. 
Servants do not question what the Lord uh, re requests of them. They just simply do what he said. It carries with it the slave-master relationship. The master uh, give the instructions and the slave carry them out without question. If you're going to be an individual that's going to be subject to Jesus and want to go to heaven, you're going to have to do what he asks you to do. What does he ask us to do? The Bible says it is written in the prophets. We shall all be taught of God. Everyone who have heard and learned of him cometh unto Christ, uh, unto God. After we've heard, we must believe it with all of our heart. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. After we believe it, we are commanded to repent of our sins. Luke 13 and 3. You cannot repent of your sins unless you have changed your attitude, changed your mind about what's right and what's wrong. What's going to cause me to change my mind? It's going to be the Word of God, that seed that we've been talking about tonight. The Word of God will cause me to want something better than what I have now. What is better than what I have now? Nothing is better than Jesus. And if you don't have Him, you don't have anything. Everything else in this world is going to fade away. It's going to pass away. And you can't carry anything with you into the next life except your soul. And if you're going to take your soul and go to heaven, you're going to have to repent of your sin. Because of the Word of God, it's going to cause you to have a change of heart, a change of attitude, a change of mind, which will produce a change in your lifestyle. And when you produce that change in your lifestyle, then you're going to be willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus himself said in Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But he that deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. And after we confess him, we must be baptized with him in the liquid grave of baptism for the remission of our sins. The Bible says that baptism washes away your sins, Acts 22 and verses 16. Uh, the Bible teaches us that baptism saves us, Mark 16, 15 and 16. It teaches us that baptism is for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verses 38. It teaches us that Baptism, baptism puts us into Christ. When we put Christ on, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 through baptism, then we have access to the Godhead. For in Colossians 2, 9, it says, For in Him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when I do that, then God is with me, He saves me, and He does something else for me. He gives me access to the blood of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. It's raining out there, I think, now. It was a little bit earlier. And most cars have what on them? Windshield wipers. What's the purpose of a windshield wiper? It's to keep your windshield clean. Am I right about it? But will a windshield wiper do any good if you fail to turn the switch on? It will not do any good. We have something like a windshield wiper, which is the blood of Jesus Christ that will cleanse us from all of our sin. But the blood of Christ will not do any good in your life unless you turn the switch on. What switch are we talking about? We're talking about the switch of obedience. You must obey Him. This is why He said in 1 John 1, 7, If we walk in the light as He's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all of our iniquity. In other words... After you're baptized, you don't have to worry about going to hell. All you have to do is just continue to walk in the light. And when you do that, and you are ready to leave this world, you can leave with the full assurance of knowing that you'll spend eternity with the Lord. And that'll be enough. If you're here tonight, and you are a member of the body of Christ, and you stand a guilty distance from God, you're in sin, all you have to do is just repent. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And I'm so glad he's not like my wife. Every now and then I mess up. You don't mess up, do you, brother? You, every now and then you mess up. And, you know, I get it straight with my wife. I tell her I'm sorry. And when I mess up again, especially if it's the same thing, she'll bring it up again and say, Uh-huh, I didn't think you had changed. Aren't you glad we don't serve a God like that? 
The Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 17, Your sins and your iniquity I will remember no more. It's a wonderful thing to know that God has truly forgiven you and your past have been wiped away. Only thing God cares about now is what you're doing today, how you're living. If you stand a guilty distance from Him, we encourage you to come. If you have not obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to come tonight. Give your heart to the Lord. Brethren, here, have the water prepared. and We'll baptize you into Christ. And you can be just as one of those Christians we talked about in Acts chapter 8. Will you come right now while we together stand and sing the song of encouragement? Aren't you glad you were here tonight? You know, the lights went out right before service started. I believe Brother McCullough could have just kept on preaching if we were in the dark. It's certainly good to be at the foot of such an experienced preacher. He said he's retired, but I hope people still keep inviting him to come. Thank you, Brother. Would you bow with me, please, and we'll be dismissed. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we've been able to be here tonight and hear your word proclaimed. And we pray that our hearts are on fire and we're ready to share your word just like Philip did. And we pray, Father, that you would use us as your servants. We ask your blessings to be upon this congregation. Help us truly to be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.